You're listening to Garibaldi Red, a Nottingham Forest podcast brought to you by Nottinghamshire Live. Hello, welcome to Garibaldi Red, a second episode of the week, and I guess one that uh, I never thought I'd record or no, the kind of thing we never thought we'd listen to, talking about war in Europe in the 21st century, which is mental. Uh, so the reason we're here is with uh, a Forest fan, Taz, who has got uh, family in Ukraine, and we'll hear all about that and his story and um, what Forest fans can do in some small way to help the situation at the moment back in Ukraine. So, uh, Taz, thanks for joining us. How are you getting on? Thanks for having me on, Matt. Thanks for having me on. Uh, quite a tough week, as you can imagine. Been in shock for a lot of it with uh, with what's going on in Ukraine. So, tell people who are listening and watching uh, about your family. Like your father's out there, is that right? Just kind of expand on that and what's happening family wise. Yeah, so I'm a I'm a third generation Ukrainian. Uh, lived in Nottingham most of my life. Season ticket holder of Forest. Uh, my dad, he's born in England, but he moved back to Ukraine about twenty years ago. Um, so I've got my dad over there. I've got extended family, cousins over there. Um, lots of friends in Kiev as well, where a lot of the missile strikes are, are landing. Um, so like, like I say, as you can imagine, quite a worrying time. Um, what part of the country is your dad in? I mean, there's no safe part of the country, but is he right in the thick of it or a, a little bit? No, I mean, luckily my dad's in uh, western Ukraine. Uh, the nearest city to him is Ternopil. They've had some missile strikes there, but they've mainly aimed, been aimed at military bases. Uh, he's, he's in quite a rural area, so he's, he's relatively safe, touch wood so far, because the Russians haven't sent any troops in there into the, uh, into the west yet. Um, my dad's got a stepson who's actually on the front line. Mm. He's been in Kherson in southern Ukraine, which the Russians have now uh, surrounded. But he was on rotation. He then went to Kharkiv in sort of northeast Ukraine, which is where a lot of uh, you might have seen a lot of the images of civilian buildings getting bombed. I think there's going to be a big humanitarian crisis there. And he's now been rotated to Donetsk, um, you know, in southeast Ukraine where uh, a lot of it started. Yeah, I suppose so you see like Kharkiv, the footage of the the bombing on the government building and stuff like that and all the horrible images like that. I mean, is your father able uh, or are you able to speak to um, his stepson who's out there? Is he able to even communicate with him and know how he's getting on? Yeah, I've been uh, messaging my dad on a daily basis to find out what's going on. Um, he gives me news from Ukraine uh, a lot of the time before before we've had it on here. Um, just let me know he's safe. Um, you know, my dad is still a British citizen, so he, he would have the chance to come back to England if he wanted to. But I think he'd rather stay there and, you know, if it came to it, fight the uh, fight the Russians. Yeah, it's mad, isn't it? I was watching, um, there's this documentary on Netflix called Winter on Fire about the 2014 revolution and the, what the people went through there with riot police killing people in the centre of Kiev when they were trying to win freedom. And they were literally willing to die. And it says something about the Ukrainian people. Like, they're not going to give up, are they, no matter what happens? No, not at all. I mean, I'm just in complete awe of them. Um, like I say, that Netflix documentary is amazing. If anyone's not seen it yet, you know, I, I recommend you go and watch it. Um, after that uprising in the revolution in 14, that's when the Russians um, took Crimea and try, you know, get into parts of eastern Ukraine. But the, the will of the Ukrainian people, the spirit of the Ukrainian people is just something to, to behold. Um, obviously, the Russians have gone in on the, you know, the uh, the premise that, the, you know, the Ukrainian people want liberating, but it, it can't be further from the truth, really. Mm. Um, and I'm just so proud seeing some of the stories of... Uh, of heroism and heroics that that, that um, that's, that's come out of Ukraine. How worried are you, though? And how worried is your dad and everyone out there? Of, you know, it's not going to end quickly, is it? I don't think Putin's going to backtrack. How worried are you for the future? I mean, I think Putin thought that he was just going to be able to walk in and, you know, take large swathes of Ukraine within 72 hours, which obviously hasn't happened. Um, and I worry that if he gets backed into a corner, which I think where it's going, and that's when he might do something stupid, start targeting civilians, trying to further invade the parts of Ukraine, get the assistance of Belarus. So it, it is worrying, and I think it's the unknown that, that, that worries people. 
nobody wants is to drag out. Nobody wants innocent lives lost. That's 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 the that's actually the worrying bit, Matt. There's just the unknown of what what what's said. Yeah, I suppose what we're already seeing is like Harkivs, like Birmingham being shelled, and the centre of that. I mean, it's crazy to think. Has it sunk in for you as a Ukrainian person? What's happening, or does it still feel a bit unreal? I mean, the first day. Um, I've been following it all on Twitter. The first day it happened, I was just in complete shock. I almost, I almost couldn't function. I had to email my boss at work saying, "There's no way I can work today" because I was just literally in shock that it had happened. You know, everyone thought it was just sort of saber rattling from Putin, getting his troops around the around the edge of Ukraine. But once he went in, I was just in complete shock. And now I'm just getting the feeling of helplessness because I can't do anything. Uh, I'm trying to get involved with volunteering, trying to get aid together, um, and just trying to spread the word of what's happening. And it's it's been really um, some of the messages I've had, heartfelt messages, uh, especially from Forest fans. I started tweeting about it on the uh, on the Forest timeline, and the amount of messages I've had of support for not only my family but for Ukrainian people in general. It is, it's honestly really, really hard on Yeah, we'll talk about what Forest fans can do in a minute. I mean, one last thing on yourself. I know we were saying before we started recording, you would have perhaps gone back and taken up arms yourself if you, if you didn't have a little boy to look after back here. Yeah, I mean, I've got an 11-year-old boy here, Luca. I think that's what's keeping me. I mean, if he wasn't here, I think I'd, I think I'd be straight over there, straight over there fighting because it, it feels like a... It feels almost like a battle of good good versus evil in the whole world. I know, I'm not sure that's exaggerating it, but it just feels like Putin needs to, he's got to be stopped. Mm, mm. If it's not Ukraine, what, what's going to be next? Mm. No, you're right. What about your boy? Does he, I mean, I've got an eight-year-old and a five-year-old and I don't think they understand uh, death or war. I certainly hope they don't particularly. Is your boy, he's 11, I mean, does he understand what's going on? Are you able to convey uh, it to him or do you want to? I try to shield him from it as much as I can, but because it's such a big part of, you know, my family and my heritage, he can't help but see it. Um, we watched the news the other day, and he he just became really withdrawn for a while, and then he just he just completely broke down in tears, mm. which is horrible to see your child like that. And I've just tried to explain to him that although it's a bad thing, he's just got to try and be proud of his Ukrainian heritage, proud of the Ukrainians how they're fighting proud of like you said earlier proud of their spirit um mm. so try and see try and see the good not there is much good in war but there are good elements and positives that he can he can take forward from it what can forest fans do then i mean we, we saw the support at the weekend you kind of hope that doesn't die down what can forest fans do on a practical level i mean i'm hoping that uh the next home game monday night against huddersfield i'll see maybe even more ukrainian flags um, we've been in touch with the club to try and do something. Uh, I may have to hear back from them, but because lots of other clubs have done things, you know, a lot of clubs smaller than ours, Bradford City, Coventry. Um, also, there's a massive show of support for the Everton City game with Zinchenko versus Mikolenko, mm -hmm. and then obviously a Wembley for the um, Carabao Cup final. You know, that was amazing seeing what what they did at Wembley. Um, be great to see more blue and yellow around the city ground on Monday night. Ukrainian flags, um, you know, like a lot of fans have pointed out to me, we've had quite a few few blue and yellow kits over the years, so people can dig them out of the back of the wardrobes, um, and then hopefully, officially, we'll get something through the club as well. Because, like you say, I don't want it to be one of those conflicts where, in a week or two, it just normalises. Mm. and people forget about it because the Ukrainian people could be suffering for months, you know, years, mm. years mm. of this. Um, there's a few places in Nottingham um, collecting aid. Um, I volunteered yesterday at Trident Security in Colic. If people want to look them up, they're collecting aid, send over to Ukraine. Uh, things like nappies, blankets, sleeping bags, dry food, um, they originally were just going to get like a sprinter van to take over, but the they were just overwhelmed by donations and kindness from the people of Nottingham, which you know times like this makes me really proud to be from from this city. There were donations coming all day, and now they're looking at raising funds to um to get a lorry to take over.
because there's been that much stuff donated. So if any Forest fans want to get involved in that, they can um, get in contact with me. I'm on Twitter. It's uh, at Taz, the U- T-A-Z, the U-K-E. Um, if they want to message me on there, then I can get them in touch with the relevant people to get to get aid. What were you saying about, before we started talking about your sister and um, the, the soldiers on the front line, and there's a there's a picture going around on Twitter, a few people have seen like, saying thank you, Nottingham, and that's sort of to do with your family, is it? Yeah, funny enough, I saw that on the Forest timeline yesterday and someone was asking about the um, about the origins of it. So my sister felt like me, she felt like she wanted to do something. Um, the battalion that I was talking about, uh, so our stepbrothers on, um, she wanted to send funds directly to them. I mean, there's loads of great places where you can donate to the cause in Ukraine. Don't get me wrong. But she wanted to know exactly where the money was going. So she sent it directly to that battalion that's that's fighting. Um, they spent it on food to replenish the troops. They spent some on repairs. There's old equipment that they want to repair um, to put back in use. And then because, obviously, my sister shared it on Facebook, that photo is going to be viral. Um, the majority of the people that donated were, you know, friends and family, most of them from Nottingham. And then that picture came back from the battalion saying, thank you, Nottingham, um, which was, you know, it's nice that they know that people are over here supporting them. And that's not just people like me of Ukrainian origin. That's any. That's anyone. Mm. You know, every. I've just been overwhelmed by the response from people, and it and it makes you realise that you know, um, sometimes you know we all whinge and moan about society and all the bad things in it, but there is there is so much good and kindness and goodwill in the world. Do the Ukrainians like your family and people out there, your friends? Do they think we're doing enough or not? There's no. They obviously people want a no-fly zone and stuff like that. Where do they stand on that? Yeah, they they all want a no-fly zone. It's hard to explain to them what the consequences of that may be. I've got a friend in Kiev who I was messaging on Facebook while he was getting having missiles landing down on him. Mm. Well, not him personally, but in in his area, and he was calling Britain and America rats mm. because they're not doing more. Um. There was also the uh, Budapest Memorandum that was signed. I forget the year off the top of my head. 94. When U- yeah. Ukraine had the um, second largest nuclear arsenal in the world. And they gave that up. Um, and America, Britain and Russia guaranteed that if they give those nuclear weapons up, they'll guarantee the territorial integrity of Ukraine. Mm which obviously hasn't happened. And ironically, it's Russia, one of the countries that gave the guarantees that mm. they're now invading. Do you think, I mean, you're just one guy, but do you think football over here needs to get its house in order a bit now? We see Abramovich is selling Chelsea. Well, you know, he wouldn't be selling Chelsea if he wasn't at risk of sanctions and Usmanov or uh, the chap at Everton. I mean, there's a lot of stuff with football and ownership, but do you think there's a bit of a, a reckoning coming now? I think so. I mean, I know a lot of people say, you know, don't try and mix sport and politics but i think this issue is is above and beyond that really mm. um we need to start questioning english football where some of the money's coming from is it from illegitimate gains um and it's sports washing at the end of the day mm. that's that's what's happening and we do need to get hold of it i know there were people that say well if that money doesn't come into england into premier league clubs will that money go elsewhere or at some point, we've got to take the moral ground and say, you know, we don't care. We, it's not for the good of our game, really. Mm. Having those sort of finances, you know, within our clubs. What would your message, last message be just to Forest fans who are listening to this? They probably feel like you, as you know, one person can't do anything, but what would your message be to them? Just get behind what's going on with Ukraine. I mean, there's the hashtag stand with Ukraine. If you just look at that on Twitter, the amount of support that it's had. Um I just want to say thanks to the Forest fans that have reached out to me. These are complete strangers that I've never met. Um, I think what summed it up was my son at the um, you know, the Bristol game. You know, I was getting a lot of hugs, fist pumps, handshakes, people talking to me. And look, I was like, oh, do you, do you know all these people? And I said, no, no, I don't know these strangers. I said, they're just good people. They're Forest fans and we, ra- we rally around each other in times of need. 
And that just, to me, summed it up. You know, complete strangers who are Forest fans are willing to show support, give words of encouragement, offer to help out. Um, a Forest fan that I met at the Bristol game turned up. There was a protest at the Brian Clough statue on Sunday. Mm. Uh, he turned up there to protest as well with some uh, sunflowers, which is the national uh, flower of Ukraine. And he gave a flower to my sister. You know, just random acts of kindness like that that uh, are just really, really heartwarming. And I just, if Forest fans can just continue to support, like I say, we can get some more blue and yellow out of the Huddersfield game, especially with it being televised. And uh, I think it'd be nice if the club would do something uh, officially as well. Thanks for talking to us about it. I don't know if it's helped you or not, but hopefully it helps Forest fans to understand what's going on. So we do appreciate it. Um, we'll be back uh, on Tuesday talking about the game. And, you know, I think Greg, who you know, says it's the most important of unimportant things, football, which I think is right to put in perspective because it does show there's certainly bigger things in life with what's going on. So um, thanks for joining us, Taz. Thanks, Robin. I appreciate that. Thank you very much. And we'll catch everyone uh, next Tuesday. Thank you for listening to Garibaldi Red, a Nottingham Forest podcast. If you enjoyed today's episode, then please let us know. We love hearing your feedback. We'll be back soon with another episode. Thanks for listening. Yeah.